now time for the Mike Wagner Show. Powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs. The Mike Wagner Show brings you famous celebrities and amazing people from all over the world. Listen online at themikewagnershow.com and on Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. And watch the interview on YouTube. So sit back and relax and enjoy the Mike Wagner Show. Hey everybody, it's Mike from the Mike Wagner Show, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs. Look at a professional website without breaking your budget. Sonic Web Studios is the answer. Sonic Web Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs that blow the competition away. Call today at 1-800-303-3960. That's 1-800-303-3960. Or email to support at sonicwebstudios.com. Mention the Mike Wagner Show, get 10% off your first order. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Also, the Mike Wagner Show can be heard on the MikeWagnerShow.com. You can check our Facebook page at Facebook.com slash the Mike Wagner Show. You can download it and listen on SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, iHeartRadio, as well as Anchor FM and Radio Public. And also watch the interview on YouTube and subscribe to the Mike Wagner Show and take the Mike Wagner Show with you on any mobile device. We're here with a wonderful lady from the Chicago area who's the author of Hopi, published by Wise Kitchen Press. She's also an inspirational speaker and a successful executive, and she's married with four kids and a grandson, sits on numerous boards, and chairman and president of an upcoming charity that's going to be uh, developing very soon. She'll talk about the book and talk about some of the ventures and getting people inspired and why this book is very suitable. So this all starts from an early age and just works their way through and just gives you just the the, the ride of your life, I could say. So ladies and gentlemen, live from outside Chicago, the author of Hopi and giving us a lot of hope and inspiration, Hope Mueller. Hope, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Mike. Anytime. So you're the author of Hopi that's published by Wise Kitchen Press. You're an inspirational speaker, successful executive, and you're also married with four kids and a grandson. You sit on numerous boards and you're chairman and president of a charity developing for this coming year. So before we get into all that, and especially on the book, tell us how I got started. How did I get started on all of that? Um, I just headed in a direction and didn't stop as uh persistence, just a lot of persistence to head in a direction and get myself to uh, where I am today. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. And you're also the author of Hopi as well, too. And um, it just take so take us from the early life to career as well, too. It's a gripping memoir written in tense past moments, reflective chapters, flash forwards, chronicles the story of a courageous girl in the 70s Southern Indiana commune, complete with flowers for dinner, a ball of acid in the freezer, and orties in the living room floor. So you can just uh, maybe just uh, give us an insight on the book as well. And if you don't want to get into the gory details, that's fine. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, so it is, uh, that is this, you know, that's the snapshot for sure. So, you know, it's early days on a commune, you know, wild chaos, you know, uh, you know, parents who are, tripping on acid while they're watching the kids. Um, we don't have any possessions, right? Everything is shared. You don't have your own bed. You don't have your own clothes. You don't have your own, you know, bookshelf or chest of drawers. Everything is, you know, whatever is there is you use. Um, and then, you know, fast forward to today and I'm a successful executive. And sometimes I sit there and I'm sitting in, you know, a meeting and a board meeting or, you know, just an important meeting that I'm sitting there making, you know, multi-million dollar decisions at. And you're sitting there and you're like, wait, how did I get here? Like, what? What is happening? <laughs> like, how is, how am I the one making decisions? How am I the one trying to you know, guide these things when, or be the rule follower, make sure everyone else is following rules. When, when I first started, you know, there, there were no rules. There's literally not a rule all the way through, you know, my early childhood to, um, you know, through high school. And then I moved out when I was 15. So, um, but even up until then, you know, there was one rule that I started to get once I hit seventh grade, I got straight A's. And that became the only rule was that I had to get good good grades, but I could smoke, I could drink, there was no curfew, I could have friends over, I could not have friends over, I could be in and out of the house. There was just not a rule to be seen. And now I sit on a lot of uh, 
a lot of roles that require all these rules. And sometimes you look back and you think, wow, like, how am I the one sitting here? Not only that, the people sitting next to you, they have a very different life experience than you, right? They've, you know, grew, grown up in more typical families with, you know, with a certain level of wealth and a certain level of, you know, these Ivy League schools. Um, and you think, hmm, well, I, I made it somehow. And that's, that's part of the reason why the book got started. That is amazing, too. Your book takes us through your early life, leads up to your career, where you're at right now. Can you take us back to some of the stories you share about life on the commune? Yeah, so one of that, I mean, so you mentioned a few of them there. So um, there there was a ball of acid in our freezer, and the adults called it sunshine. Mm-hmm. Um, and on their assigned uh, time to watch the kids, they would shave that off and, you know, trip trip on acid during their uh, shift to watch the kids. Um, some other things, a really fun story is, you know, when food was tight um, and money might, might have been tight, um, my mom would send us out and we would go collect flowers. So we always lived near like a park or even a cemetery. And I don't know if you know this, but daylilies uh, can be eaten. So we would go and pick those orange daylilies and we'd bring them home and mom would dredge them in flour and cook them up in a cast iron skillet of my grandma's. And we had thought we had made it. Like it was such a special day that we got to eat dinner, you know, uh, flowers for dinner. But I, in retrospect, as an adult, you think, well, maybe it's because we didn't have any food that we were picking flowers from the cemetery to actually get dinner cooked. Um, those, you know, and some of the other pieces, there was a lot of, um, it was like a pack of kids, right? So I was one of the youngest pack of kids, and the kids did a lot of just being on their own and taking care of their own. And it was good and bad, right? Because I was one of the youngest. They could pretty much make me do anything that they wanted. Mm -hmm. Um, And sometimes that got me into near danger. But a lot of times they were more aware and conscious uh, than some of the adults in our area. So, you know, they we definitely watched out for each other, uh, but they also got to got to get whatever they wanted from the littles. That is amazing, too. And how many families were living in the commune at the time? Uh, so I don't honestly really know. So what it was was a co-op commune situation where kids and adults, so kids could be dropped off at any time during the day, and adults... All the adults, all the adults had to do was sign up for shift to watch the kids. Um, so it's probably a fluid number. It probably wasn't very many, maybe 10, 15 families. Wow. Um, and kids got pretty close, but um, we actually lived there, right? So there was just a few families who lived there, but most of the families were transient. So it was a lot of You don't know who's going to be in the house. You don't know what kids are going to be in the house. You don't know what adults are going to be in the house. Um, And you don't know who's going to be watching you. Uh, So it's just a lot of just just pure chaos. Mm -hmm. Chaos. And also also getting back to the flowers for dinner as well, too. What were some of the other flowers that you um, had for dinner, Mm -hmm. too? And I remember dandelions were very common, like dandelion soup or dandelion, you know, everything else. And what are some of the other flowers that you have for dinner? Most of the flowers we we did mostly did the day lilies. We did definitely have dandelions. Mom knew how to turn that into tea and some other things. But I mean, our garden we always had a garden, although we had to move a lot. So we didn't know if we would be around when it was time to um, harvest the garden. But Mom always grew pot plants back there too, and mm-hmm. um, we all we got taught at an early age how to harvest the pot plants. And she taught me to roll a joint at ten years old um, at our kitchen table, wow. not to smoke it with her, but just to know how to do it, which did come in handy in my high school years. <laughs> but... <laughs> hey, where's Willie when you need him? <laughs> yeah. Where's the where's the only girl in the room who can roll a joint? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is something. That's something. And can you talk about some of the lessons you've taken from your early life experiences you're able to apply in business today? Yeah, so that is the interesting thing is being in such a 
wild, chaotic environment. I definitely thrive in chaos. I thrive in something very busy, um, and I turn it into order. So I'm very, very comfortable with change, and it doesn't matter what industry you're in. It doesn't matter what you're doing. Uh, change is coming, and it's coming fast, and it's coming frequently. And if you can get comfortable with change, you can always be more successful. And then I'm focused on problem solving, right? Like, I want to fix problems. I want to make things orderly. But because of you know, the, some of the chaos we had, um, you know, I started creating my own order. So at 10, I wanted, you know, my room was clean. I, you know, made my bed every morning. I organized my shirts. They were in color-coded order. Um, and I create started to create order for myself. So those two things, you know, being comfortable with change and then being a problem solver and focusing on getting things, you know, taking that chaos and creating systems of order out of it. That is what I've done with that first thing we talked about with being just pure persistence, right? Like you just drive really hard towards the goal. And then of course, there's no way you can't do it if you don't have a million people who are help you along the way, different mentors and people who invest in you and people who take the time to, you know, help you along the way. So those are the three things that although it was wild, um, honestly, in many ways, it benefited, you know, me and my career. It sounds amazing, too, on how you can benefit from that. What are some of the examples of uh, chaos that you've been involved in? Um, at, well, at home or at work or do you have um, a... it, can, it, it can be at home or mm -hmm. and or it can be at work. So take your pick. Okay. Well, you know, one of the interesting parts, and this is in the book, is... We moved out of the commune about five, six, maybe seven. So I was pretty young. But then my mom married her third husband, and we moved into this really strict, you know, violent alcoholic home where you had to sit down for dinner. You had to put your napkin on your lap. You had a pitcher of milk and a pitcher of water on the table. You had to put the put the dishes, you know, a certain way. And it, so we went from this free form wild love you know super fun for the adults just pure chaos into this super structure you know about six or seven and although it was it came with some violence and it definitely came with addictions i gravitated to it because it was so orderly because dinner was served pretty consistently because we moved less frequently so that change there really resonated with me and i think it happened at a young enough age that i could you know roll with it i could adapt to this really strict structure and i actually you know i enjoyed that time because of the order that was provided um, and I got pretty comfortable with the violence because I felt like that came with some of those Mavlov's hierarchy of needs. You need food, you need, <laughs> you need a, you know, a place to sleep. And so, yeah, it comes with violence. We can take that into. And, and where'd you go afterwards, uh, out of the violent home? Well, so then we moved back into, so they got divorced and, um, then we moved into back into a pretty chaotic environment. It wasn't a, it wasn't a commune. Um, but my mom, um, you know, started working at a bar at night because she could, you know, make some decent money there. And that spoke to a lot of her inner demons and her addictions. Um, and so although it wasn't a commune, there was quite a few, people that rolled through the house, you know, her drug dealing boyfriend or some other guy or lots of people coming in and out of the house. Um, and so chaos ensued pretty quickly thereafter. Um, and so that's part of the reason why I moved out when I was 15. I, um, I had an opportunity, put a, me and my girlfriend put a PowerPoint together. Um, my mom was pretty fine with it. My older sister had already moved out when she was 16. Um, and my only rule was, yeah, you can move out, but you can't you can't let your grades fall. That That is amazing, too. And, of course, we'll get to more about uh, your life at 15. You listen to the Mike <laughs> Wagner Show at the themikewagnershow.com, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs. Looking for a professional website without breaking your budget? Sonic Web Studios is the answer. Sonic Web Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs that blow the competition away. Call today at 1-800-303-3960. That's 1-800-303-3960 or email to support at sonicwebstudios.com. Mention the Mike Wagner Show, get 10% off your first order. Sonic Web Studios, 
Take your image to the next level. Also, The Mike Wagner Show can be heard on themikewagnershow.com. Also, check our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Show. You can download and listen on Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, Anchor FM, as well as Radio Public and iHeartRadio, and also watch the interview on YouTube and subscribe to The Mike Wagner Show on YouTube and take The Mike Wagner Show with you on any mobile device. We're here with Hope Mueller, the author of Hopi, published by Wise Kitchen Press. She's an inspirational speaker, successful executive, married with four kids, and a grandson sits on numerous boards and chairman of a present of an upcoming charity of this year we'll be talking about. We talked a little bit about the book and also talked about the upbringing in a commune and also in a strict environment. And you got to a point where you're starting your own life at the age of 15. And, of course, and you know, another question before we get to that, what do you wish a 50, as a 15-year-old you would have known then? That's a great question. I don't think anyone's asked me that question. What would I have known then? I don't have anything specific that I would go back and say, oh, Hope, if you only knew this. Um, You know, I think there's real value and you have to go through your set of experiences. You have to make your journey um, going. And I'm just not the type who spends a lot of time, uh, you know, regretting or reminiscing about what could have been. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, certainly there's things I could have done differently, but um, honestly, it probably had to happen pretty close to the way it did. I uh, got myself out of high school. I, you know, started college at 17, um, finished halfway, you know, with only one extra semester under my belt because I had my uh, oldest daughter halfway through college. But I, I, there's not a lot I'd go back and say, oh, if I only knew this Because I just was going for it. I was just going to persist. I was heading in a direction. And, you know, there's not a lot of saying, oh, well, if I only knew this, maybe this would have happened differently. I feel like the journey is the journey. And you got to appreciate it for what it is. And, you know, and that makes you who you are today. That was amazing, too. And what do you want the other 15-year-old girls to know? Don't move out. Live with your parents. (laughs) (laughs) I, I think that one's too obvious, but maybe something a little deeper than that. But I think that hits common sense with some people. I'll tell you that. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. I have now my oldest is 26 and then I, my next is 19. Um, and I look at them at 15. I think, no way, um, you know, and they push back. Um, but they, you know, I pre- have run a pretty typical family uh, now and uh you know, they they have a safe space to operate within. Um, and, of course, they're afforded a lot of uh, things that I, you know, that I wasn't. I try not to, to do too much because I don't want to be defined um, by my material goods or, you know, or, or wealth or lack of wealth. I want to be who I am. And so, you know, you don't, you don't, you want your kids to pick up on that also. But, Certainly, I look at them and I think, no way would I let them move out of 15. <laughs> no way. Or, or live in a commune as well, too. So or eating flowers. Yeah, <laughs> or, yeah. or dandelion soup or dandelion tea. Or yeah. Dandelions, right. <laughs> Cook them up. Cook there, them up. There you go. <laughs> and what are some of the things you had to learn the hard way? Oh, I had to learn how to uh, not take people's goods. <laughs> so my college roommate was a saint, right? So I would just walk into her closet and I would wear her clothes. And she just, you know, she was just really patient and sweet with me about it. And I, it, the only time she really got upset was when I loaned her car to someone else without asking. Uh-oh. Like, like, who does that? Who Like, I think of that now and I'm thinking, wow, I was so naive where I just really aren't aren't attached to material goods in uh, ways that most most people are. And she, you know, that was probably the only time she got really mad, but she was super patient with me. And, you know, she taught me how that, you know, you don't go into my closet and wear my clothes. You could, you're welcome to ask. And yes, we might share, but you should ask and we should oh, oh, do oh, it this way. Oh, oh, exactly. Of course, that's the thing I hate to say that it seems to be a lost art these days when it comes to, um, you know, taking things and borrowing and everything else. And I think you pretty much give a really good point on, um, you know, 
you know, what to say, what not to say, and everything else. And of course, you graduate um, at 17. You uh, you begin your career, and you can just uh, take us, uh, you know, where you first started, you know, getting your first job um, and everything, all the way up to uh, where you're currently at. Oh, well, I graduated from high school at 17, and then I graduated from college, I don't know, maybe 22, 23. Um, and, yeah, so I went into the uh, medical device firm first out of college, and then I moved to a pharmaceutical firm because at the medical device firm, I was making more at Kentucky Fried Chicken when I was 15 than I did at the medical device firm. Oh, my and gosh. I know, and I went to them. I said, can you, like, pay me more? I have a degree. And they said, ah, everyone stays, you know, starts at this level, and we feel good with your $13,000. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, I, I got to get out of here. So I went and worked um, in a microbiology lab at a pharmaceutical firm um, and was doing that for a while. And one of my girlfriends left, and she went to Eli Lilly. Mm -hmm. So I hand her my resume, and I said, hey, if they have a job open, like, <laughs> You know, give them my resume. So I eventually made it to Eli Lilly for a few years. Um, and uh, Baxter had purchased the company that I was working at in Bloomington, Indiana. Mm -hmm. And it was only 10 minutes from my house. So my previous boss calls me. He's like, Hope, I can pay you. Come back. Nice. And I said, all right, I will totally come back. Um, and then that's when I started um, my uh, progression through leadership. I was a supervisor, then I was a manager of one lab, and then I managed multiple labs, um, and then I was doing a uh, facility-wide role, and then they promoted me to a divisional level over eight sites, and that's what moved me up to the northern Illinois, uh, Chicago land area. Um, and then, you know, there's just different steps made from there, uh, so that's how it happens, and you just... Keep pushing forward. And, of course, you don't need to eat chicken to do so as well. So you think about it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Kentucky Fried Chicken, everything is made from scratch. Just so you know, at least it was back when I worked there in high school. Mm -hmm. Like everything, you're rolling out the dough, you're putting the chicken in the flour. I mean, it's it's handmade food. And, and, and of course, you're making me hungry as well, too. Better than dandelions. <laughs> Better than dandelions or flowers. Okay, well, I'll get one of my assistants to bring me some Kentucky Fried Chicken. Hey, get me Kentucky Fried Chicken. We'll get to a more of your book while uh, my assistants get me Kentucky Fried Chicken and some dandelions. Listen to the Mike Wagner Show at the themikewagnershow.com, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs. Look at a professional website without breaking your budget. Sonic Web Studios is the answer. Sonic Web Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs that blow the competition away. Call today at 1-800-303-3960. That's 1-800-303-3960. Or email to support at sonicwebstudios.com. Mention the Mike Wagner Show. Get 10% off your first order. Sonic Web Studios. Bring, take your image to the next level. Also, the Mike Wagner Show can be heard on the themikewagnershow.com. Also, check our Facebook page, facebook.com slash the Mike Wagner Show. You can download and listen on Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, Anchor FM, as well as Radio Public and iHeartRadio. And also, check our YouTube channel, subscribe to the Mike Wagner Show, and check out our interview. You can take the Mike Wagner Show with you on any mobile device. We're here with Hope Mueller, the author of Hopey, published by Wise Kitchen Press. She's an inspirational speaker, successful executive, married with four kids and a grandson, and sits on numerous boards and chairman and president of a charity developing this year. You know, talk about that. And, of course, let's get to more about uh, Hopey as well, too. You talked about the, the, the story of... Um, a memoir written in intense past moments, reflective chapters, flash forwards, and everything else. Um, story of a courageous girl in the 70s, Southern Indiana coming. We talked about that. And before we get into more of that, um, what was the um, main reason you wrote the book? You know, that's it's a great it's a it's a great question, and I it's I really been working hard at coming up with this really inspirational answer, but part of it it just had to come out like it just had to happen. Um, I was working at a smaller firm and um, I had a lot of extra time on my hands, so I joined all of these volunteers, these non for profit committees, and I still had some extra time on my hands. And if you download the sample chapter. Um, from Hopi.net, you can, that opening scene, which is the sample chapter, that played in the back of my head for a couple of years. And I knew that if I ever wrote a book, 
that would be my opening scene. So one day I just started to write, and then the the, the whole thing just poured out of me. Um, and the book ends, just so you know, and the reader, you know, the listeners know, the book ends when I take my college interest exams, other than the little flash forwards and little glimpses of my life today. Um, so on top of it, there's some um, some element of, oh, I just had to have it happen. It just wanted to come out. But then I was acquired. My small firm was acquired by a larger firm. And I thought I wasn't going to have a job. They already had a vice president in my role. I thought, oh, they, are they going to need another one? So I spent two or three months trying to greenfield it because what happens sometimes in your career is you just you get pulled along and it's, it has its own inertia and you don't have a lot of opportunity to stop and say, okay, wait, is this really what I want to do? So I went to a writer's conference and I realized, oh, this is just a whole nother job. <laughs> but I had no idea what I was doing. Like, you could pay $10 and you could pitch to somebody. I'd never pitched. My book was, a, you know, it's 70% complete and it was the first draft disaster. But I pitched three people, you know, because on the first day they teach you how to pitch. So I wrote that down and practiced for three days. Um, and then three, two out of the three were like, yeah, send me what you got. And I thought, oh, I can't send this to anyone. <laughs> it's a disaster. So then I hooked myself up with an editing partner. We got it to a good spot. And then I found a publishing, you know, partner and, and we were getting it out there. So a lot of it was it just had to happen. You know, something inside of you had to happen. And then it became a goal pretty goal oriented so then i have to get it launched so that's where we're at that is amazing too and no pun intended what do you hope people will gain from reading it you know it is about being inspired and it's about knowing that no matter who you are or where you started or even where you're at today you can go out and do amazing things whatever that amazing looks like you can focus and drive and just go be amazing. And I just want everyone to know it doesn't matter doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you started. It doesn't matter where you what you experienced. If you want to go out there and, you know, do amazing things, it's out there for the taking. You know, it's interesting the other day on Facebook, um, one of these uh, you know, quizzes was rolling around. And it oh, was yes. Just, I remember yeah. those that just either gets a lot of likes or encourages viruses or try to get your personal information. I know how it is, but go ahead. Yeah, no, they definitely are. And it was uh, 10 childhood traumas. And you give yourself a point for everyone that you had experienced. And the guy that had posted it, like, I know him. He's, you know, a friend of mine. He had, I thought he had an interest, or he did have an interesting childhood. And I said, well, what's your score? And he said, two. And I thought, oh, nuts, because mine's eight, right? I had eight out of these 10 childhood ex- traumas that, that I had experienced. But there was one that I didn't, and this was uh, parents who belittled you or parents who made you feel small or parents who didn't believe in you or didn't encourage you. I didn't have that. So throughout everything, my mom, my dad, the majority of the adults in my life told me I could be amazing things. I could go do amazing things. I could be an astronaut or a doctor, a neurosurgeon, a, you know, a bull writer, literally whatever I wanted to do, I could go out and do. And I feel like that is the foundation you can build on. Because if you believe and you believe in yourself, and if you didn't get that as a kid, go make it for yourself. If you believe in yourself, you can go make amazing things happen. But I had to have that one. And that's the most important one out of the 10, at least on that Facebook quiz. <laughs> and, and of course, Facebook does good things as well, too, I have to say. So in, mm-hmm. in your book, you say every in your book, you say every childhood shapes a child. Mine was tumultuous, but here I am standing strong and grateful. How has your experience shaped your parenting? Um, so I do... Uh, give my kids a ton of space. I'm certainly the opposite of a helicopter mom. Um, But what I do is I try and create the space um, within a safe space to make those. So you give them the boundaries, it's safe space, but you give them a lot of um, autonomy and decision making. And they have the full range of those, the benefits of those decisions and the consequences of those decisions. Um, 
but certainly I'm not, I'm not forcing them to go off and do anything. I try and get that foundation of belief in. I let them know how amazing they are and what wonderful people they are and they can do whatever it is they want to do. Um, I, you know, I have told my eight year old, she can be a bull rider, although I really don't want her to do that, but if she really <laughs> it's, wants to it, do it's, it. it's actually a fun sport. Although I tried a mechanical bull one time and I lasted just <laughs> one second, you know, up where we're at in uh, North Dakota, it's like, I've seen three guys that had done it in eight seconds. And of course, you know, wow. think if you can do it in eight seconds, anybody can do it. So, you know, think about That's that. Crazy. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. But uh, of course, you know, c- continue your saying though. Yeah, no, I mean, so that's the type of parent I try to, you know, you give them a big, big, strong foundation of love and acceptance. And, um, but I give them a ton of room to be who they are and to grow into who they want to be. That is, um, that is amazing, too. And what advice do you have for someone who's lived through chaos, confusion, and doesn't know how to get their bearings in life? I would say get that foundation of belief. If you can you know, find a way to believe in yourself and know that you can do whatever it is you can what set out to do, you know, if you want to be an executive or if you want to be, you know, living, living on a mountaintop, you know, riding mountain bikes all day, um, whatever, if you build, you have to build from that foundation of belief. So if you don't have that, get help, right? Go, mm-hmm. go find a therapist, surround yourself with people who know and love you. Um, start there and then focus on those other things. Find find a way to be comfortable with change. Focus on problem solving and then just persist, persist, persist. Because if you do that, you will, you will get done whatever it is you want to set out to get done. That is amazing, too. And we'll talk about your career as well, too, and some of the uh, not-for-profit boards you're on. You listen to The Mike Wagner Show at themikewagnershow.com, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs. Look at a professional website without breaking your budget. Sonic Web Studios is the answer. Sonic Web Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs that blow the competition away. Call today at 1-800-303-3960. That's 1-800-303-3960. Or email to support at sonicwebstudios.com. Mention the Mike Wagner Show. Get 10% off your first order. Sonic Web Studios. Take your image to next level. Also, the Mike Wagner Show can be heard on the themikewagnershow.com. Also, check our Facebook page, facebook.com slash the Mike Wagner Show. You can download and listen on Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, as well as iHeartRadio, Anchor FM, and Radio Public. You can also watch the interview on YouTube on The Mike Wagner Show. Make sure you subscribe to The Mike Wagner Show channel and take The Mike Wagner Show with you on any mobile device. We're here with the author of Hopi, published by Wise Kitchen Press, Hope Mueller. She's an inspirational speaker, successful executive, married with four kids and a grandson, sits on numerous boards, and chairman and president of a char- charity developing for 2019 and just, we'll get into that, and uh, you know, we talked about the scholarship and some of the uh, not-for-profit boards you sit on, and uh, tell us all about the uh, scholarship and some of the boards you sit on. Um, um, okay, uh, so I the scholarship we started last year. Um, my nineteen-year-old uh, um, experienced a major trauma when she was between fifteen and uh, sixteen, between her sophomore and junior year summer. And, um, you know, we made it through, but we made it through by creating a safety net with her school and with the teachers and administrators of her school. And when she graduated, you know, I felt like, (laughs) I felt like a fruit basket was going to be insufficient in thanking these people Mm. for helping me. So, and helping my daughter, Um, So what we did was we came up with a scholarship in her name um, for uh, youths who have experienced some trauma or some, you know, major hardship in their uh, young life and, um, you know, want to want to go off to school. And um, and part of what I do is it's a way to honor the teachers and administrators that help my daughter, too. So every year I get to. You know, they're on the committee. I get to take them out to dinner. We get to talk. I get to thank them again. I get to thank them in front of everyone um, when we um, give out the scholarship. And then we get to help out somebody who's uh, made it through some of their own hardship. So um, it's we've only done it the once and we started it this year. Um, Well, we started it last year, but this was the first year we distributed it. And it was wildly rewarding. 
Um, and, uh, you know, it was really good for both me and, um, you know, my whole family. But my 19-year-old loves to be a part of it. And uh, next year she wants to be the one that, you know, do the speech and do the handout of the scholarship. Um, and she, you know, sees the value in giving back also. So that's been a really uh, nice, rewarding opportunity for us and our family. That is fantastic. And how does one apply for a scholarship? So this scholarship is just our local high school scholarship. Um, and so they they lo- uh, they apply through the school's counseling office. Um, so we had 19 candidates um, and, you know, we we gave we couldn't resist giving a second one away um, when we were doing our selection and our selection committee. So we had two two folks that, um, you know, got a little bit of benefit and uh, when they go off to college. That was amazing. And do you plan to keep the scholarship local in the area or any plans to expand it statewide or nationwide or globally? No, it's definitely pretty niche to this set of school, you know, these teachers and administrators. Um, but certainly the charity uh, will be a nationwide charity. Paperwork is submitted and hopefully the IRS will eventually get back to me. Um, <laughs> the, uh, so that charity is a charity that was actually named after the commune. So it's a Hunter Street, uh, Hunter Street charity. And what we're doing there is um, allowing folks uh, to, you know, children and families in need and during critical junctures of their lives to apply for um, any dollar amount. You know, you need help getting your rent paid. You need help because your car broke down. And especially those families that are just on the borderline of, you know, just making it, just barely making it. You know, your car breaking down can be just going to be a massive you know, massive differentiator between success, you know, long-term success or, or, you know, short-term failure, if you will. So um, that that charity would be, you know, you can, when it's up and running, um, after the IRS gives us our number, uh, you can just, would be able to apply through our website. Okay, that'd be great. And then you can give it out uh, later on as well, too. Yeah. And, and how about some of the other uh, not-for-profit boards you sit on? So I sit on probably too many. I've gotten a little crazy, but you know, here's the thing. Like I just, you get to a point and you know, I don't know, maybe five to seven years ago, I was telling my husband, he said, you know, sits on a couple of non-for-profit boards. I said, you know, we're really in a position where we have to start, you know, giving back and making a difference, you know, for other folks. Um, and so we do spend a lot of time doing that, but it's wildly rewarding. I, I focus on, I try and focus on three areas because it's, there's a little bit of hope. You got to pick a struggle here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you can't fix everything, right? Um, <laughs> so I, so I'm super passionate about um, developing females in leadership uh, and just and women in careers. I have four daughters. I'm massively invested in their long-term success and having them have the same opportunities that anyone else. So that's an area that we stay focused on. Um, STEM or STEAM, or so a science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, we put um, a lot of time in the youth um, youth opportunities there. Again, sometimes I gravitate towards uh, female STEM opportunities. And then uh, one that I, I'm going to roll off of a couple of boards, and I'm going to join a new board this year, it's called CASA, um, and that is for kids that are in the foster home system. So, um, you know, kids who are in transient housing, and, um, you know, I'm not going to be their mentor because that's a different time commitment that I don't have, but I am going to sit on the board and try and make a difference in those children's lives. That is amazing, too, and looking forward to having and have you talk about that as well later on. And where do you see yourself career-wise in the next five years? Um, well, I, you know, and continue my journey in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, certainly, um, you know, I would want to be an author and speaker. Um, and part of the reason why I'm getting this ready at this earlier stage of my career, not earlier, mid-stage, mid to late stage. Oh, my gosh. How old am I? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Only one hopes, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Um, it's a late stage career. I don't know what the phrasing is. Um, so no, I, you know, I want to lay a foundation of having something to parlay my, you know, final career into. And that's where I'll be a full-time author and speaker. Is that five years? Is that seven years? Um, you know, there's mergers and acquisitions every day in my industry. Uh Part of the reason why 
you know, I started, I actually wanted to make sure this got out there and I was launching on a certain timeline was because a lot of people that I work with are impacted by those in their late stage careers, right? They're 50, they're 55, and all of a sudden they are laid off with a big group of people and they are looking at each other saying, what am I going to do? I got to go to get a job. And I'm thinking, oh yeah, I don't want to be, I don't want to be there. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be like last minute planning at 55. Like, where am I going to go work? Like I will have, I want to have a foundation laid for, um, you know, full-time author and speaking. Right. Exactly too. And of course the people above 50 are like the most common to get laid off. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's just, what did God say about that? Yeah. It's well, it's, you know, it's amazing. These women, they're in my network. We uh, sit on a couple of boards with each other for, um, you know, for promoting women leadership in uh, the healthcare space. And they, you know, are. They're, these are big titles, too. These are VPs. These are SVPs. These are CFOs or, you know, CEOs. And they are, you know, all of a sudden between in their mid, early 50s, you know, looking, saying, okay, Um, yeah, I don't, I'm, I was just laid off. What do I do? And I, you know, so it was interesting. I told that little bit of the story when we were acquired, you know, you get, you get in it, your own momentum and your own inertia, and there's just not very many opportunities in your life, or maybe there are more opportunities and we don't, we're just not smart enough to take them where you step back and you reflect and you say, okay, is this what I want to do? During that period, I totally told my husband, I was like, I'm going to go be a barista, and then I'm going to open a balloon store, and then I'm going to be a writer. Barista <laughs> balloons, husband, I like that. <laughs> I know. And my husband is like, what are you talking about right now? <laughs> and the company that acquired us, like, I found a seat. I found a seat at the table, but there was, you know, a few months there that I didn't know where I, if I was going to end up there. So, But I wanted to honor that opportunity, say, okay, well, really – who do I want to be? And is this really the direction I want to continue to head? Do I want to continue to stay in this space for another, you know, five, 10, 15 years? Mm -hmm. That is amazing too. And it's good to get everything all planned out where most people don't do it. And of all the (laughs) projects you have been involved in, especially starting, you know, way back in the commune and everything else, what do you consider your most favorite project and the most challenging? Uh, well, <laughs> if anyone says anything other than parenting, they're lying to themselves because that is a project, right? I, uh, you have you are doing your level best every day to, you know, provide, keep people safe, give them opportunities, expose them to new opportunities and new challenges, let them experience both success and failure, um, help them do goal setting. Um, and certainly it's hard to see if you're being successful or not. Right. And, um, you know, that's parenting is easily the biggest project easily. That's not, there's not even anything close to it. I mean, work projects are work projects. The book one was pretty exciting and has been wildly exciting. I have no idea what I'm doing every day, um, on the book, but my, my publisher and my marketing team try to keep me on the straight and narrow, but um, you know, and certainly those non-for-profit activities are, uh, you know, they're just work. You just, you just get some stuff t- typed up, sent off and hope it, hope it flies. Um, but certainly parenting, um, it's a long-term commitment and it's hard to see your success or failure along the way. Mm-hmm. That is amazing too. And what do you consider your most memorable moment? Oh, f- uh, from parenting? It, it, or... can, it can be from anything. From my most memorable moment. These are good questions, Mike. I have been on three or four of these so far, and no one's asked me that one. <laughs> you're, you're, um, doing, you're doing a great job, I'll tell you oh, that. Great. You're doing a great good, job. Good, good. Um, you know, I have a really beautiful moment that I reflect on more than once. So I went, you know, I got, my, got to college, and it is funny. You talk now, and these kids – have a lot of help from their parents, right? Like picking the college, filling out applications. I made my kids do all of that. And honestly, I have no idea. I can look back now. I have no idea how that even happened. Like I, I don't know how it happened. I got it done. I got into school. I started, right? So that was a big accomplishment 
in getting my degree. And I told you a little bit about that transition of going from the med device company to the pharmaceutical company. And I made, um, so my med device company, I made $13,000 a year and I was waitressing two nights a week so that I could keep the medical device job. And I was making more, way more waitressing. Um, but I knew there was no long-term plan waitressing, right? Like that, they're just, that's it. Mm -hmm. So when I went to the pharmaceutical company, I made, I, I doubled my income. I got $27,000 a year. Mm. And I I'm not really that old. I promise. It wasn't like in the forties, but I thought I had made it. I was so like, oh my God, I had made it. And my mom gave to me, gave me a Christmas gift that year. She had actually framed my college degree. Nice. And when I opened it, I just started crying because I understood its value. I sat there, I'm looking at it and, you know, cause when you're, when you're struggling and you're still working two or three jobs and you have your degree and you're thinking, what am I doing? How, how is this the benefit? And then you, you make this big, you know, sort of big change. And I thought, oh, this is it. Right. And this is, this is meaningful. And it was just a, it's a really beautiful gift for her to do. And, you know, I, these are things that are expensive. Like we would take these for granted now, or I would, right? We're mm -hmm. getting a degree frame. That thing costs money. It's probably two or three hundred dollars. My mom didn't have that. So for I knew what it meant and then I knew what it meant for me that I had an an ability to, you know, to go off and, you know, succeed in ways that um you know, that I maybe didn't even realize at the time. That is amazing, too. And we're very happy what you accomplished. We'd love to have you back on again and keep us up to date with all the um, not-for-profit boards, your projects, and more about your book as well, too. And who do you consider biggest influence in your career? Oh, ah, that's easy. My husband. <laughs> My husband, he is. Um, it's our second marriage, and second marriages are the best, by the way. Um, no, he's uh, he is certainly my biggest fan, my biggest supporter. He is my confidant. He is my partner. Um, every decision is made together. We talk of, you know, the book, certainly this book would never have gotten done if I um, didn't have him in my corner helping me out. And certainly the career um, and the partnership that we have in um, our careers is unparalleled. Um, certainly I would never have made it to where I'm at without his partnership and love. That is amazing, too, and just wonderful how you guys work. And what's the best advice you can give to anybody at this point? Oh, about marriage? Uh, just, best best uh, advice about anything, like with uh, we, uh, okay. we talked about, like with the parenting, yeah. the writing, the boards, or anything. Mm. Best advice in general. You You can be amazing. You are amazing, actually. You can go off and do whatever it is that you're dreaming to go off and do. You go off, you believe in yourself, and you persist through the challenges, you focus on the problem solving, and you just go make it happen. So it doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter where you started, doesn't matter where you're at right now today, you can go off and be amazing and do all of the things that you wanted to do. That is amazing. And just the best advice there is. And of course, you know, we'd like to thank you very, very, very much for your time. Hope Mueller, the author of Hopey, published by Wise Kitchen Press. And uh, tell us about your upcoming projects, your website, how do they contact you and where can they pur purchase the book? Yeah, so you can go to Hopi.net um, and you can download the sample chapter. But the book is uh, for sale on all major markets right now. So Amazon, Books a Million, Bards and Noble, um, and it's pre-sales right now. So pre-sales um, actually start uh, August 22nd. They are no, I know they're all up and running right now. So, um, and so you can go on all of those major websites and buy the book. Um, and it actually is launching on October 1st. So it'll be a couple of weeks before they ship it out to you, but you can go buy it now. That is amazing too. And one more time about the scholarship. How can one apply? This scholarship is just a local scholarship to our high school. Um, and when, and you'll have to bring me back for when I get the uh, approval from the uh, IRS so that I could share with you our uh, non for profit website. That is amazing, too. Well, definitely have you back on Hope. Just want to say you've been a great inspiration. You gave us a lot of hope, no pun intended. And we mm -hmm. hope to have you back on soon. Oh, oh, wait a minute. Not Hope. 
definitely have you back on yeah. soon. So, so yeah, once, ag- once again, a great thank you for being on the program. We'd love to have you back again soon. And please do us a favor and keep us up to date. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me on, Mike. Thanks for listening to The Mike Wagner Show, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all your needs. Listen online at themikewagnershow.com and on Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. And watch the interview on YouTube. Also, become a sponsor of the program and or donate today at themikewagnershow.com. Join us again tomorrow for another episode of The Mike Wagner Show.